episode contains the discussion of the sexual assault and murder of women, which some people may find disturbing. If you wish to avoid this conversation, please skip the middle and end of the episode with the exact times given in the show notes. Take care of yourself, folks. Australia's military history is more than just a collection of dates and the locations of war-ravaged battlefields. It is the stories of service and sacrifice of those who have answered the call of their country of birth or adoption and the enduring legacy they have created. Join me as we look into one of those stories. I'm your host, Ross Manuel, and welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, Australia's Military History, a Doc Network podcast. Now let's get started. Vivian Bullwinkle was born on the 18th of December 1915 in Kapunda, South Australia, her parents having migrated from England three years earlier. Vivian completed her general nursing training at Broken Hill and District Hospital in far western New South Wales in 1938 at the age of 23 and completed her midwifery certification the following year. From there, she moved to Hamilton, Victoria to commence nursing. In 1940, as the threat of war in the Pacific loomed, Bullwinkle relocated to Melbourne to assist in the war effort, working at the Jesse McPherson Hospital in Clayton, a suburb of Melbourne. She was initially ineligible for overseas service as there was a requirement at the time that all military nurses to have a minimum of 12 months of hospital experience, B25, and had to have completed both ward and surgical training before they could be accepted for military service. In 1941, Bullwinkle applied to join the Royal Australian Air Force Nursing Service, but was rejected on medical grounds. She was then accepted into the 2nd Australian Imperial Force in May 1941 and commenced army training in Puckapunyal, Victoria on the 9th of August 1941. On the 2nd of September, Vivian Bullwinkle was transferred to the Australian Army Nursing Service and assigned to the 2nd 13th Australian General Hospital as a staff nurse bound for Malaya aboard the Australian hospital ship Wanganella. At this time, as the war in Europe was looking bleak for the British, they had started to strip their overseas garrisons to reinforce the British garrison on the perceived threat of German invasion, leaving the defence of these territories to Dominion troops, mainly from Australia, India and Canada. The Dominions were autonomous communities within the British Empire who were essentially self-governing, and the British made extensive use of these forces in North Africa, the Middle East and the Pacific. In fact, Australia already had two divisions, the 6th and 7th Australian Imperial Force, in the desert, and a third, the 8th Division, was being raised at the same time as the formation of the 2nd 13th AGH, and would join them in Malaya to serve alongside Indian and British forces. There was already an Australian General Hospital in Malaya at the time, the 2nd 10th AGH, as well as the 24th Casualty Clearing Station, and staff nurse Bullwinkle would regularly transfer between both hospitals in Singapore and Sumatra, primarily treating the large number of tropical-based afflictions there. In October 1941, Bullwinkle would be based at Johor Bahru in Malaya and would stay there until December 1941 when the Japanese would commence their land invasion of the Malayan Peninsula. Just a point of historical context, the Japanese launched their invasion of Malaya 10 hours before their attack on Pearl Harbor and simultaneously with attacks in Hong Kong, Wake Island, Guam, and the Philippines. While the defenders of Malaya would try and stall the Japanese advance as long as possible until the hoped-for reinforcements from either Britain or America arrived, which were never coming, the strategic downside of Britain's reliance on Dominion troops and the Allies' policy of prioritising winning the war in Europe first disadvantaged the Australian, British, and Indian troops as they were largely inexperienced, overall poorly led, and undersupplied and under-equipped. Now, this isn't to discount the brave actions of the individual soldiers in the defence, They were simply facing a much more experienced, motivated, and eager Japanese force who had already been fighting for several years before this attack. Even the arrival of the Royal Navy battleships HMS Prince of Wales and Repulse, while a massive boon to morale, they could not halt the rapid and devastating Japanese advance, as they would both be sunk on the 10th of December, just two days after their arrival. Despite these setbacks, the Allies would continue to fight valiantly until January, when the 2nd 13th, along with British and Dominion troops, would be pushed back to the tiny island fortress of Singapore. On the 12th of February and the fall of Singapore reality, it was decided that more than 300 predominantly European civilians, government officials and wounded soldiers, along with 65 nurses, would be evacuated by the Royal Yacht of Sarawak, the SS Werner Brook. It is at this time that Sister Bullwinkle's service record goes silent, as she would be officially listed as missing on the 16th of February 1942, as the garrison would surrender to the Japanese. This, however, is not where her story ends. On Valentine's Day 1942, Japanese aircraft would relocate the Werner Brook and attack it with machine guns and bombs, sinking it and forcing the survivors overboard. Twelve nurses would be killed in the sinking, most would make it to life rafts or cling to debris, 
Of those that survived, 22 nurses, including staff nurse Bullwinkle, would wash ashore on Raji Beach on Banker Island in the Dutch East Indies in what is now modern-day Indonesia. The remainder would either be lost at sea or went down with the ship, or washed ashore on other beaches and were picked up by the Japanese. They would be joined by a large number of survivors, mainly wounded soldiers and civilians, and over the following two days, they'd be joined by approximately 100 British soldiers from another ship sunk in the region, and the group assessed their options. After they determined their location and discovered it had fallen to the Japanese, it was decided that the survivors of the Vernabrook would surrender, and the Vernabrook's chief engineer set out to the nearest inhabited centre in order to facilitate the surrender. While they waited, Irene Drummond, the matron of the 2nd 13th AGH, urged the civilians and their company to make their way to the island's capital of Montauk, leaving the nurses to care for the wounded. By mid-morning, the ship's officer returned with a party of Japanese soldiers to officiate the surrender. When they arrived, the approximately 15 soldiers immediately segregated the soldiers and nurses and then ordered all the walking wounded to head inland under guard, leaving the nurses and the more critically wounded on the beach. The walking wounded would be executed, though the manner in which this happened is up to some dispute, with some accounts stating that they were bayoneted, while others stating that they were lined up then machine gunned, with those attempting to flee into the sea only to be cut down as well. As the Japanese soldiers returned, it became abundantly clear what had happened as the Japanese soldiers sat down in front of the nurses and cleaned the blood off their weapons. The women, 22 nurses and one civilian, were then ordered into the sea as a machine gun was set up on the shore. Once they were waist deep, shoulder to shoulder, the Red Cross armbands worn like shields, the Japanese opened fire on them, killing them all, save for Vivian Bullwinkle. The last words heard before the shooting started was from Matron Irene Drummond again, saying... Quote, chin up girls, I'm proud and love you all, unquote. Sister Bullwinkle was struck once high on the right hip and floated motionless amongst the surf, playing dead until the Japanese departed. She would then return to the beach and crawl to nearby bushland, where she passed out for several days until she was discovered by Private Patrick Kingsley, a wounded survivor of the massacre. Tending to their wounds, the two would encounter another survivor, Stoker Lloyd. Both he and Private Kingsley had been part of the walking wounded party, led around the headlands, and survived the same way Vivian Bullwinkle had. After 12 days, relying on the help of locals, it was decided that it was in their best interest to surrender, and the three deciding to admit the fact they were survivors of what is now called the Banker Island Massacre. For the next three and a half years, Sister Bullwinkle would move around the Indonesian prison of war camps until she was liberated in September 1945. She would be one of just 24 of the 65 nurses of the Vernabrook to survive the war. After a brief stay in hospital to recover from the effects of her captivity, Sister Bullwinkle, now a lieutenant, as she was promoted in absentia in 1943, would continue to serve now as part of the British Commonwealth Occupation Force in Japan until her resignation at the rank of captain in 1947, to assume the post of Director of Nursing at the Fairfield Infectious Disease Hospital, a position she would hold until 1977. In 1947, she would also testify before the War Crimes Tribunal in Tokyo about what had happened. She would remain part of the Citizens Military Force and eventually retire from the military at the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 1970. After the war, Matron Bullwinkle continued to be active and devoted her life to nursing and honouring those who died on the Banker Island Massacre. She also continued to raise funds for memorials dedicated to nurses and served on several committees. She was also the first woman to be member of the Council of the Australian War Memorial and became the president of the Australian College of Nursing. In 1975, during another major conflict, Matron Bullwinkle would once again work with the military as her hospital had been selected to receive orphans evacuated from the Vietnam War during Operation Babylift. And while she was 60, she organised and led a nursing team to Vietnam to oversee the Australian side of the operation. Matron Vivian Bullwinkle, at 62, her nursing career over, married longtime beau Colonel Francis West Statham in September 1977 and moved to Perth, Western Australia. She would continue to remain active in her philanthropic roles and in 1992 she would actually return to Banker Island to unveil a monument to those who'd been killed. Throughout her life, Vivian Bullwinkle had earned awards and commendations bestowed upon her. She was a recipient of the Florence Nightingale Medal, Associate Member of the Royal Red Cross, Member of the British Empire and Officer of the Order of Australia. She would also have several portions of hospitals, care facilities, nursing residences and sections of military installations named after her. Vivian Bullwinkle died of a heart attack on the 3rd of July 2000, aged 84. After her death, she would be inducted to the Victorian Honour Roll of Women, an honour roll recognising the achievements of women from Victoria, which is ironic considering she's from South Australia. 
More recently, with the 80th anniversary of the Bankaran Massacre in 2022, the Australian College of Nursing is currently raising funds for the construction of a bronze statue of Matron Bullwinkle to be placed on the grounds of the Australian War Memorial. I can say with great certainty that as a people, we are truly proud of Matron Vivian Bullwinkle. In the following section, I will be discussing the 2017 allegations of sexual assault against the nurses on Banker Island. If this is not something you wish to hear, please feel free to end the episode now, and I'll catch you next time. Take care of yourself. Unsurprisingly, this part of the episode has probably been the most difficult to write and record, but it would be remiss of me if I didn't discuss what was uncovered in 2017 following the investigative works of historian Lynette Silver, broadcaster Tess Lawrence, and biographer Barbara Angel. In the main section of this episode, I gave you what is considered the official account of what happened on Banker Island, where the nurses were marched into the sea, then they were gunned down, leaving only Vivian Bullwinkle as the sole survivor. Sadly, it would seem that this is not all that happened. Following an interview in 2000 with Tess Williams, Vivian Bullwinkle stated that most of the nurses had been violated prior to their murder. Part of the reason why it took 75 years for this information to come to light was partly due to the fact that Vivian alleges that she had been ordered not to speak of this by her military and political superiors and was effectively gagged from ever speaking about it, especially during the 1946 and 1947 Tokyo War Crimes Tribunals, where she was giving deposition on the Banker Island Massacre and the effects of the nurses while in captivity in Indonesia. However, this is not just the account of one person. Her historian, Lynette Silver and biographer Barbara Angel, were able to uncover a number of different interviews and accounts from other nurses and serving Japanese personnel who were on the island at the time. They had also been able to uncover a number of documents, some of which were been partially destroyed, which included official statements made by nurses and other survivors of the sinking of the Werner Brook. In some instances, entire paragraphs have been deleted and sentences containing statements made by nurses simply end midway through. Telling Barbara Angel, who forensically inspected Vivian Bullwinkle's uniform and discovered that namely the buttons at the top of her bodice had been reattached with mismatched thread and were most likely the two missing buttons from the bottom of her uniform. This suggested that her uniform had been ripped open with enough force to dislodge the buttons from the top of her bodice. She was also able to forensically determine that the only way that the bullet holes on Vivian Bullwinkle's uniform lined up with her known wound sites was if the uniform was open at the front. Silver believes that the reasons why, if there are any official demands to keep Bullwinkle quiet about the alleged sexual assault, were made, they were done with the best intentions to protect the families from knowing the details. It was due to a misguided pretense of protecting the image of the nurses from the stigma associated being raped, something that was still very much taboo back in the 40s and 50s and was considered a fate worse than death, and was in the fact still a hangable offence until 1950. This was especially considering the fact the nurses had to be at least 25 and either single or widowed. She also goes on to say that there was potential also a degree of guilt on behalf of the government and senior officers as they knew Japanese troops had raped and murdered British nurses in the St. Stephen's College massacre during the fall of Hong Kong, but was slow to recall the Australian nurses from Singapore. Sadly, the perpetrators of this massacre still remain unknown and have escaped any punishment for their crime. So sadly, this history will only ever remain an allegation, but hopefully now that it has been come to light, some peace can come to those who have suffered. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job Australia's Military History Podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was recorded on the lands of the Gangdangara people whose elders have passed on knowledge for thousands of years, and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. This episode was written, researched, produced, directed, and audio engineered by me, Ross, with additional research done by Laurie Favell of My Silent Hero. If you do know someone whose story needs to be told, feel free to leave a comment on an episode or send us an email at IWasOnlyDoingMyJobPod at gmail.com. If you like what we do here and you want to support this podcast, the best thing you can do is share this with a friend or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform as it really helps others find the show. And if you want to join in on the conversation, join us over on Discord. And if you want more content, including show notes, photos, transcripts, and my various adventures finding memorials dotted around Australia, head over to our website at www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on all our social media pages at IWODMJ. Don't worry, there are links to everything in the show notes. Join me personally for more bite-sized history over on TikTok and pretty much everywhere else at Doc Winters. All opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the speaker and do not reflect the views or opinions of any entity, agency, or organization. It is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike 4.0 International License. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time. Bye.